Um, well, thank you, and thank you for this uh, session because this is essentially what passes for fun for me at the moment. I am holding down two jobs, trying to write up my PhD, and uh, I saw this session and I was really pleased to talk about something that is related to my PhD, but it's kind of around it. And this is my, you know, kind of winding down towards the end of the year. Um, I will say, uh, I think a few of us have said this in sessions, I'll disclaim that I, I do work for Historic England, so I'm a Heritage at Risk Project Officer over in Manchester, uh, the North West Office, and at the moment I'm a temporary Assistant Inspector of Ancient Monuments over in Yorkshire. Um, essentially, I've always, I've always loved reading um, and watching general fiction and sci-fi, and I found it as a way of escaping the mundane and indulging in the fantastical. And actually, before I studied archaeology, um, I studied GCSE and A-level English literature. And really, sci-fi, more than anything, is about endless possibilities and different realities, diverse cultures. Um, and these alternate realities are portrayed as vastly different from our own, but as Penelope says, uh, they're familiar to us because in the end they're constructed by human authors and they're a product of their time or their context. And I'm pleased that through my PhD research, um, I've actually been able to bring together my archaeology and my English literature, and through a critical discourse approach to the concept of sustainability within archaeological heritage management, um, and particularly the way the concept of sustainability is constructed and applied in policy and guidance. It's not as exciting as sci-fi, but you know, fair enough. Um, so I'm going to use Isaac Asimov's novel, The End of Eternity, to discuss some of my research interests, um, particularly materiality and trade of resources between centuries, um, and the idea that managers of time, or whether you're a, an archaeological heritage resource manager, um, we undertake work for the greater good, and we're somehow supposed to be neutral and detached, of course, up until the point where we discover that we're only human, and that human connection, human emotion, and more than anything, though these are stronger than our kind of social conditioning and our professional conditioning. And also to think about the subject of sustainability and the notion of using it to push boundaries like sci-fi, rather than using it as a buzzword to prop up existing systems and ways of thinking um, as a meaningless buzzword. So we discussed this earlier, but um, until we can directly observe the past, we will continue to interpret it from materials that persist in the present. So until we have time travel, all we can do is look at the materials that are present and try and reconstruct the past in the best way we can, in multiple ways. As many of us are well aware, representation of the past is contested, and it's not something that's merely constructed or accounted from the material remains, but it is actively constructed through the process of interpretation. Many people in the past have believed that science will give us the answers, but science, even though it will give you measurements, it will give you things that are um, factual, we still then, within an archaeological framework, interpret that. In my professional roles, I've dealt with the management of the archaeological record as a latent resource, as well as being involved in the process of attaching meaning and value to these materials in the process of heritage making. The discipline of archaeological heritage management is traditionally constructed around the narrative that the past is a finite, fragile, non-renewable resource. And this has of course been extremely successful discourse for the protection of, the, of archaeological materials. Although the materials of archaeology might be considered to be finite in the sense that some classes and types of material cannot be recreated, or they can't if we hold to the notion of things like authenticity, um, but what we can do with various classes of archaeological material and what isn't finite, and as Cornelius Holthoff has, has expressed and various other authors, that it's the process of archaeology that's actually infinite in the sense that um, it can be renewable, we can recast um, the materials, we can rework narratives um, infinitely. But you may be wondering why on earth I've got a picture of Raiders of the Last Ark. Uh, Raiders? No? Yes? yes. Lost. Oh, never mind. It's, it's getting towards the end of the year. Um, this has been, for a long time, my favourite analogy in terms of depicting what I think was really well summed up by Roger M. Thomas back in 1991, that archaeology has been the victim of its own success. So the fictional Ark of the Covenant is priceless, but it's squirrelled away um, with who knows what else within this massive warehouse. And actually, in Crystal Skull, we find that actually there's a million corpse in there, and it's part of Area 51. But at the end of Raiders, you don't necessarily know that. 
I found over, so actually not whilst I've been working as an archaeologist, but some of the best stuff is in stores. So when I was in school, I worked in uh, the museum at Bury in Greater Manchester, and I couldn't believe that they had a Lowry in the basement because they just didn't have enough space to display it. I believe it's now gone to the Lowry, Art Gal uh, the Lowry Galleries in Manchester, or Salford rather. So we collect these priceless or so-called priceless important cultural artifacts for future generations to appreciate and study, but we often neglect them in the intervening period, and that's the present. The irony is that a rhetoric of preservation for future generations and keeping for posterity actually places economic stress on our already struggling museums and archives, and it reduces the likeliness of the archaeological resource making it into this unknown future. Unlike As Asimov's novel, we can't simply send the archaeological resource directly into the future, and therefore it needs to make it. We need it needs to make it into the um, future by being relevant in the present and to contemporary societies. So we understand that prevailing social, economic, environmental, and political conditions have and continue to influence our construction of the past. And in, this has been, there's many examples of this uh, that are negative or relating to the concept of nation building, but more recently the modern concept of environmental, social and economic sustainability has influenced narratives with a focus on showing sustainability in the past, whether this is through land use or land management. And you may ask yourself, why is this? Well actually it's because of the need of us to make heritage relevant to contemporary societies and sustainability and environmental issues are very much hot topics at the moment and have been actually for the last 30 odd years. So we actively shape the past or the representation of it in the present which in turn shapes the way we will deal with the past in the future through legislation, policy and teaching. The discourse, the rhetoric and the framework is essentially the one thing that is self-sustaining about archaeology or archaeological heritage management. The way we have approached archaeological heritage management in the past influences the present and it will continue to influence the future. So for example in Britain we are still influenced by a framework for preservation and protection that has not fundamentally changed since it was established in the late 19th century. We try to make it more inclusive but we are essentially appending diverse values to this framework rather than fundamentally changing the process of heritage making. So where does sci-fi and fiction come into this? Well, archaeology has often relied upon analogies taken from the present that we project, project onto the past, but what about ideas from the future and projecting that back onto the present and to the past? But what do we know of the future because we haven't got there yet? Well, actually we have, and many authors and screenwriters have been there, and these creative minds have imagined new worlds and reimagined our world changed by technology, space and time travel. Some of the, what was essentially fiction in the 19th century has now become science fact, and I will thoroughly admit to pilfering that from, uh, uh, what was it, Thor, yeah, the other day, which I was watching. I was like, damn it, that's really great. Um, so yeah, it obviously wasn't Thor, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said it, but um, many science writers and scientists, they choose to exercise their imaginations to push what is possible during their time. And time travel has been a key theme in sci-fi, and this remains elusive, but films like Interstellar are suggesting how this might be possible. And actually, the, the, the greatest review of Interstellar was that my mum didn't fall asleep during the middle of it. She, and she actually understood it, and she hates stuff like that, she absolutely hates it. Um, so often the idea of using it to right wrongs, and I think I particularly enjoyed Stephen King's 112263, um, which was reflecting the human desire for do-overs, or to right historic wrongs. Sci-fi is particularly interesting because of its tendency to push boundaries of what's considered possible, or at least currently possible. And we need this kind of out-of-the-box thinking to challenge and change conservative discourse and practice within archaeology that's led to issues of disciplinary unsustainability. So finally, I get to the end of eternity. Um, it's taken eternity to get here. Um, but a few years ago, during a PhD supervision um, with John Carmen, he actually recommended to me Isaac Asimov's 1955 novel, End of Eternity. So it's John's fault. It's always John's fault. <laughs> and this is because, as you'll find later on in the session, John is a huge sci-fi fan. Um, and although it maybe wasn't intended to inform my research, it's actually helped me think through some of my research themes. 
And this is because fiction can be a way of freeing yourself from the shackles of normalised thinking. And the benefits of using fiction for lateral thinking to take a break from academic texts, which, let's be honest, sometimes uh, you have to reread them and reread them, you still don't understand what they're talking about, so it's nice to have a bit of a break. Um, but to still be thinking through the problems, um, and this was reaffirmed actually by my manager, Dr. Keith Emmerich, um, who did more or less the same thing whilst completing his PhD. He was reading a book and suddenly he thought, aha, I understand all this stuff about identity. So end of eternity is full of metaphors relating to how resource needs and tastes will change between centuries, with some being more materialistic than others, although we do assume that materialism and consumption will continue to increase within a capitalist framework. But we do also need to be prepared for the possibility that in future we might be less materialistic and the hoarding that we've undertaken on behalf of the future might actually not be appreciated. And it also talks about reality. So the novel looks at the way in which reality of the past is constructed and manipulated in the present, or in the novel it's manipulated by eternity, which is an intertemporal organisation that controls time. As a youngster, the protagonist, Andrew Harlan, is taken into eternity and trained to be a technician to enact reality changes. And this is to ensure that he's not getting emotionally invested um, in the changes that he's making. So he's, he's detached from um, the various past, present, future. He's, he's within eternity. But, of course, this changes when he meets what becomes his love interest, um, Noyes Lambent. So I found that the way End of Eternity describes intertemporal trade of resources useful for thinking through my research on sustainability discourse within archaeological heritage management. Um, and my research takes a social constructivist perspective to look at how particular ways of constructing the concept of sustainability shapes how it's understood and implemented or not in relation to archaeology. And the or not is probably quite a big bit of what I'm doing. Um, so discourse in action, and it's basically how discourse can affect and enact reality. So we're aware of the role of narrative um, influenced by contemporary thinking in archaeological interpretation. But actually, we forget that um, this is equally applicable to the guidance policy and legislative framework. <laughs> Tongue tied. But this is not neutral. Our framework is not a neutral thing. Um, it's, been, it's been created by humans, and therefore it's been influenced at some point, at some point by somebody's thinking. Um, but just as eternity makes decisions about how to adjust time and move resources between centuries for the so-called benefit of humanity, heritage managers make decisions now about what is worthy of being protected for the future. So archaeological heritage management is a one-way intertemporal inter trade. Don't necessarily get anything back, but we're certainly pushing it forward. Although an alternate analogy that's been used actually by the Heritage Futures Project is that of the gift to the future, which may or may not be wanted or welcome. And uh, I've added this in because John reminded me that the there's a causal loop within the story, I'm not going to spoil it, um, which reminded me of what John said um, about the designation and the fact that we value it, so therefore it's designated, but then again, we also value it because it's designated and it's similar with the heritage cycle. So I found that my experience of being embedded within archaeological heritage management framework might be actually likened to Andrew's experience of being within eternity. Although I wasn't extracted and brought into this framework as a youngster, I thoroughly chose archaeology, maybe slightly misinformed as an 18-year-old, but never mind. Um, the need for neutrality and, and impartiality has led to me being detached from heritage. I managed it for other people, but I wasn't necessarily connected to it. And this was easy enough when I was dealing with heritage of other people, which was quite often a bit alien to my own upbringing and worldview. But actually, it wasn't so easy when I got um, a heritage management job in the region I grew up in. And I found that I was stuck between my home when or where and the context that I grew up in and the professional academic archaeological heritage management world that I've worked hard to be part of and to secure my future in, but I still don't really feel that I actually belong to it. 
And actually for me, seeing my own heritage decimated and transformed into something a million miles away from the human suffering and exploitation it embodied, to see it rebranded as a revived northern powerhouse, which is potentially just as exploitative as the Victorian version. So replacing factory owners with the region investor, with regional out of region investors. And I realized that I was actually part of the problem, but I couldn't necessarily do anything about it. And this led to a lot of internal conflict. So sustainability has been conceived of as a revolution, but it's often used as a buzzword to prop up existing systems and frameworks by different socioeconomic means, rather than seeing the framework as the problem that needs to be changed. What changed this was some pretty good advice from the guy who brought to you Lego Theory of Heritage, uh, Neil Redfern, after a meeting with the Castleford Heritage Trust in Wakefield. And I realized that the most important part of my work is making and facilitating genuine human connections and not just necessarily with stuff, but with people. And that I can't and shouldn't actually take myself out of this process. I can't be neutral and I shouldn't necessarily need to be. The chair of the trust said something about aspirations in socioeconomically deprived former industrial areas that really resonated with me. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a professional meeting um, and yet it was still very emotional, the things that she was saying to me. Um, and essentially I realized, um, and, and Neil essentially just said, you need to find your own way through it. And I was like, okay, so I need to find my, my own framework um, to actually deal with this existing framework I work within that's actually steeped in privilege and exclusion. And I need to understand what does it mean to me and how could I help others to discover what it may or may not mean to them or could mean to them. So no one has the right to tell people how things are, but they should give them the ability to make their own decisions and choices. And this sentiment is expressed by Noyes when she realizes how eternity have been shaping reality and history. Um, and she exclaims, how dare they? Um, and this is why really I believe that the critical appraisal of what is presented as facts or now unfacts in a post-truth world, I mean, seriously, I think Orwell <laughs> is turning in his grave. Um, but I finally don't feel alone and I don't feel adrift. And this has been 10 years now because things are starting to change. And actually, I think they, they'd already changed quite a while ago with one or two individuals who are working within their own frameworks within this authorized heritage governance framework. And we had a, a bit of an example of that yesterday. And it's also the idea that heritage is supposed to be emotional. Me having that connection is not necessarily a bad thing. So I feel that the preservation for posterity or eternity is ending. And what we have is the idea of infinite possibilities in relation to the tangible and intangible aspects of heritage. Or as Neil put it, everything is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> everything could possibly be awesome if we make it awesome, I think is what I would add. Um, and this is really, it's my favorite ending to a novel, you know, the end of eternity and the start of infinity. Thank you.